Ghosts appear in many forms. We can see them. What was that? We can hear them. I am not afraid. And sometimes we can even feel them. We've gone around the globe in search of the most terrifying spirits and supernatural beings who continue to live on long after their deaths. On world's scariest hauntings, anything can happen. Because you never know who's watching when the lights go out. In this episode, a 19th century time capsule hidden in a modern world haunted by three generations of the same New York family who call it home. This has been my home my entire life. Why would I leave when this is my safe place? This is my happy place. Paranormal recordings frighten even the hardiest of ghost hunters. Jeez. What was that? And I was out of this building so quickly, I must have set a new world's record. I was terrified. It's no wonder that paranormal investigators from around the world want to spend the night at the merchant's house. I don't want to call it the Holy Grail, because that would be crazy, but this is the Holy Grail of, of haunted houses. The Merchant's House Museum has stood in Manhattan for over 185 years. Home to one family and one family only, the house has remained uninhabited since 1933. Now a museum, visitors regularly come to find out more about life in 19th century New York. But it's the ghosts of the Treadwell family that interest paranormal investigators from around the world. For almost a hundred years, three generations of the Treadwells called 29 East 4th Street their home, and many believe that they've never truly left. Anthony Beloff has been a volunteer at the museum for over 30 years. During some of the ghost tours, we have had people uh, feel, you know, someone breathing on their neck and they turn around, no one's there, tapped on the shoulder. People have been seen walking by in rooms that are empty. We don't know how well the Treadwells like having their house open to the public. They seem to be accommodating us. And we like to think it's because they realize that with the public coming here, we can raise the funds to keep the house standing. Communications manager Emily Hill Wright believes that stepping foot inside the museum is like going back in time. I certainly think that people's experiences are real here in the house, that people um, feel touched by history. They walk into these rooms and they really feel what it would have been like to be here in the 19th century and that can't help but bring up questions of whether the family is still here. If you lived here, you wouldn't want to leave either. The house has changed so little since that time, if Einstein's correct, and time is not linear, but just keeps happening. I like to think that sometimes we just bump into each other. They're still here living their lives, using the objects that are still here in the house, and we're here on a different date, you know, a different time, and sometimes we just overlap and we just bump into each other. Which leads me to, to wonder, do they see us? and think we're ghosts. They might not even see the people that are around and they just might be still in their same time and place when they left it. So it's very normal to them. But in the cases that I've seen of families staying on the land or in the home, it's more of a, let me protect the house. This is my land. This is where I grew up. It's sentimental to them. One of the apparitions who has been seen is Horace Treadwell, the eldest son of Patriarch Seabree and his wife Eliza. 
Roberta Belulovic remembers the day of his ghostly appearance. A couple of summers ago, two men came into the museum and they were doing the self-guided tour. And they went downstairs where the tours start and in fact the first room people visit is this one. And five or ten minutes after they came in, one of them came up the stairs and he said, I saw Horace in the family room and I said, how did you know it was Horace? And he, he showed me the book and at that time we had family pictures in the book and he said it was him and, and I said, what was he doing? Was he, did he say anything? Was he doing anything? And he said he was dressed all in black, he was carrying a top hat and he was leaning on the mantelpiece and the young man felt he must have been in mourning. He looked very unhappy, he said. Horace's sad disposition is in keeping with the history of the house. He experienced almost all his family members dying, so yes, yeah, certainly, at least, at the very least, his parents. How he would have felt about that is hard to know. Very frequently in the 19th century, wakes and even sometimes funerals were held in the house itself, uh, in the front parlor, generally speaking. So that might have been the day of a funeral, for all we know, or afterwards, after they had gone to the cemetery and come back. While modern Manhattan has shot up around it, the Merchant's House Museum has remained in New York's trendy NoHo district for over 185 years. New York City in 1832 was just the smaller version of what it is today. The reason the Merchant's House was built on East 4th Street was basically the whole area was being developed as a suburban enclave for the very wealthy. The house was built in 1832, and the family who lived here, the Treadwells, moved in in 1835. Seabury Treadwell, the patriarch of the family, and his wife Eliza had eight children. The youngest, Gertrude, was born here in this house in 1840. She lived here her entire life. She never married, and she died in the house in 1933, so almost 100 years after her father purchased the home. Today, the museum is complete with the Treadwell family's original belongings, their furniture, their personal possessions, and even their clothing. The gentleman who lived here, Seabury Treadwell, he was a successful hardware merchant. And hardware in those days meant basically anything made out of metal. He was 55 years old, and he had made his fortune. And so he moved his family, his wife, to the suburbs, which was this house, and he retired here. The townhouse has five floors and would have been a hive of activity in 19th century cosmopolitan Manhattan. In 1855, the New York State Census indicates that there were 21 people living here. Now that includes the eight children, some of whom had married and moved out, but then moved back in with their husbands and their children. And there were also four servants who lived in the house with the family for, as far as we know, the entire 19th century. In 2018, this really is a time capsule of that mid-19th century period. The Treadwells made very few structural changes to the house. And so today, the museum really gives visitors an unparalleled look at what life was really like in the mid-19th century. The last remaining Treadwell, Gertrude, passed away in 1933. Rescued from demolition by a cousin of the family, the house opened as a museum in 1936. Reports of paranormal activity have been rife ever since. I've been a volunteer since the early 80s, and I had the pleasure at the time of working with Joe Roberto, who was the architect who saved the building from collapse in the 1970s. Joe and I had a very special relationship. He sensed the kindred spirit in me, at least with regard to the paranormal. And he began alluding to certain things which had been reported as having taken place in the museum over the years. And uh, he would tell me, Anthony, there's stories about the house. And he shared some of them with me. The staff themselves have had some unexplainable encounters over the years. There have been a few things that have happened while I have been here that I don't have an answer for. We do a raffle every Christmas, and one of the raffle prizes a few years ago was a, a crystal dish. We had it in the very center of our conference table up in the offices, waiting for the 
prize winner to come and collect her prize. On Friday, when we left for the weekend, it was right in the very center of the table. And when we came in on Monday, the dish was shattered in pieces on the floor. During the weekends, the offices are locked and closed, so members of the public cannot get into the offices. The staff isn't up on that office floor. So we really have no explanation for that. Hesitant at first, the museum has now allowed a paranormal investigator to look into the supernatural happenings. Ghost hunter Dan Sturges has exclusive access to the merchant's house, and during the past 12 years, he's carried out over 75 investigations. As a paranormal investigator, the merchant's house is, is on everybody's radar, so I heard about it when I moved to the city 30 years ago. As an investigator, it's a place that you want to come. It's sort of on, your, on everybody's bucket list. Dan's favorite ghost hunting tool is a voice recorder, and over the years, he's captured many ghostly EVPs. EVP is short for electronic voice phenomenon, and uh, it's essentially when you've captured communication with a ghost or a spirit, uh, supposedly, through an electronic device that would record that. But it's a brilliant way of evidencing that spirits are there because you can have direct communication with them. You can ask out, call out, say something, ask questions, and you might get a clear response left on the recorder. Dan's most recent EVP was captured in the kitchen on the basement level of the house. We were all hungry, so we sort of left the recorders running in an empty house. A few weeks later, I'm listening to the nothing. For an hour, this is 56 minutes into the recording, and we captured something that I can't explain. And, uh, and it's the only time I've ever gotten scared about from anything that I've captured here at the house, so it's pretty creepy. This was something that made noise in the kitchen. I don't know what it is, but I don't plan on investigating the kitchen anytime soon, so it's a good creepy noise. It's recordings like this that keep Dan coming back for more. I don't want to call it the Holy Grail, because that would be crazy, but this is the Holy Grail of, of haunted houses. It's no surprise that New Yorkers and tourists alike continue to visit the 19th century townhouse, hoping to catch a glimpse of the ghostly Treadwell family. Twenty nine East Fourth Street in New York City, now known as the Merchant's House Museum, was built in 1832. Seabree and Eliza Treadwell already had seven children when they moved into the Grand Townhouse in 1835. Their eighth and final child, Gertrude, was born here and died here. Gertrude Treadwell was the youngest of eight children. She grew up and lived in the house itself for almost 100 years. She never married and died aged 93 in 1933. Four of the Treadwell daughters did not marry, which was not as unusual as we think nowadays. There was a growing movement in the 19th century for people to marry for love, not for a sense of duty. And it just seems that at least three of the girls chose to remain single, to remain spinsters. Gertrude, on the other hand, had a love affair which went sour, unfortunately because her father forbade her to marry her choice. He was a medical student named Louis Walton. The real problem was that he was Catholic, and the Treadwells were Anglicans, they were Episcopalians. And this was just not done. So the family legend, which we have every reason to believe, says that Gertrude said, if I can't marry Dr. Walton, then I'll marry no one. And so she devoted her time to pressing flowers, charitable work, taking care of her elderly parents, and basically when they passed on, taking care of this house and keeping the house as Papa wanted it. 
By the time Gertrude died, she had run out of money. Um, women of this class would not have worked, and Seabury Treadwell left all of his children a pretty substantial sum of money when he died. But Gertrude was 23 when her father died, and she lived just shy of her 93rd birthday. So at 70 years, you live that long, eventually the money just runs out. By the time Gertrude died, there were several mortgages on this house, and she was really quite impoverished. However, the spirit of Gertrude Treadwell lives on. The very first story that we have in our museum archives is actually from shortly after Gertrude's death in 1933. Gertrude passed away in the late summer. And early fall, we get beautiful days in New York. And so the neighbors were all outside on their front stoops and enjoying the beautiful fall weather. The children were playing very rowdily right in front of the house. Stickball, Ring Olivio, whatever the game was that they were playing. And suddenly the front door of this building flew open. And a petite elderly woman wearing a brown dress and a very old fashioned cut was seen to rush out on the stoop and wave her arms and chase the children away. Very stern, very upset. And then she went back in. The children were terrified simply because everybody on the block knew that Gertrude had passed away about two weeks prior. And there were many, many people out on the street and they all saw this woman and they said, it was Gertrude. But there are lots of stories throughout the years of visitors, staff members, just people walking by, hearing things, seeing things, having paranormal experiences here in the house. So it's a long history of stories. Anthony himself remembers his first encounter with Gertrude. This is the rear bedroom on the master floor. We call it Mrs. Treadwell's bedroom. This is the bed we have every reason to believe Gertrude was born in. And these are the things that the family owned. This is also the room in which I had my own first paranormal experience, which was a terrifying one. I was closing up and came into this room just to check on it, and everything was open just the way you see it now. Lights on, windows open. I walked up the hallway and closed the front of this floor first, and then I returned down the interior passageway. And that door, which should have been opened, was closed, though I wasn't really paying attention. It didn't strike me as odd until I opened it and stepped back into this room, which less than two minutes before had been wide open and illuminated, and the shutters were closed, they were bolted, the lights were turned off, and even the door to the entrance, which I had glanced into 45 seconds prior, was closed. It's often said that the blinds and doors open and close on their own in Mrs. Treadwell's room. And I believe that this is an intelligent spirit. She's able to manipulate objects, move furniture, turn lights on, and interact with objects around the building. Walking past a room and seeing blinds open and lights on, that is a ghost that has to interact with certain electricity, has to pull the blinds open, it takes an enormous amount of energy for them to be able to do that. So that is very intelligent. I stopped in my tracks in that doorway, paralyzed, just absolutely paralyzed. It wouldn't make sense. It didn't compute what had happened here. And my heart started beating, I started shaking, and I bolted up the staircase to the offices, grabbed my things, and I was out of this building so quickly, I must have set a new world's record. I did not come into work the next day. I was, I was terrified. With so many people coming and going over the 100-year history of the Treadwell family's residence in the home, it's no wonder the building is teeming with paranormal energy. Orbs are the early manifestation of a spirit apparition. Um, they are classed as energy balls. Basically, what happens when a spirit manifests itself, it needs energy to be able to manifest. And what happens is the orbs start to manifest as small lights of energy and then materialise into full-blown apparitions. So there have been reports of orbs 
pictured throughout the house, and I believe that that's because of all of the energy. The family is very predominant in the home. They've owned the home, they have passed away in the home, so that right there in itself would have a lot of energy. I would say a lot of residual energy. And a lot of the energy in the house is powerful enough to make you jump. The last time that I was truly terrified when something happened in the house was during one of our paranormal investigations with Dan Sturgis. I had been taking things pretty much in stride and become quite used to the unexplainable things that seem to happen on an occasional basis here at the museum, but this one was disturbing. We were conducting an investigation and we were here in Mr. Treadwell's bedroom. It was night, it was dark, and there were about five of us in the room, uh, the usual team and a guest psychic joining us that night. And she verbalized that she got the impression that someone wanted the lights turned off, that the lights were disturbing someone. She said, is that it? Do you want the lights turned off? And suddenly this door right behind me slammed. Does somebody want these lights turned off? Jeez. What was that? I screamed like a little schoolgirl, and it sounded like the door that was behind me slammed shut. I have to preface this by saying the door was shut at the time. So it was like this, and yet, boom! Jeez. What was that? It slammed with such force as if it had been wide open and somebody had just slammed it like that. Now, I was standing there by that window, and I saw the whole thing. And I even saw the door vibrate slightly. Dan Sturgis was standing right here next to the door, and he jumped. And we were all really disturbed, really disturbed by this. We opened up the door. There's nothing inside the closet to make that noise. Jeez, what was that? It was a noise that came out of nowhere. And, uh, and everybody jumped. We were able to play it back. It came off on all the recorders. So it was an actual physical noise. A lot of time with EVP, you'll catch them only on one recorder rather than all the recorders that are running. But this came across on, on all the recorders. What was that? The sort of ghost that is thought to be sort of banging on doors would be considered a poltergeist or uh, an intelligent spirit. A poltergeist is thought to be a spirit that is uh, somehow trapped and unable to ascend to the next realm, whatever that might be a ghost that would move objects around or interact with the sort of material world that we're familiar with. And I pulled out my cell phone to call my sister and tell her what had just happened. And as I held the phone in my hand, I watched the battery level go, and suddenly the phone died right in my hand. That made it even scarier, because now this strange, scary thing had happened, and suddenly I couldn't even call for help. The Merchant's House is a treasure trove of paranormal activity. The Treadwell family seem reluctant to leave their home and will make themselves known however and whenever they want to. The Merchant's House Museum in Manhattan, New York, is a time capsule that has remained relatively untouched since the Treadwell family lived there. It's been 85 years since the house has been inhabited, but many believe the family have refused to move out. In this instance, I think people have linked the Treadwell family to the actual location because they were the first owners of the property and right up until the death of the youngest child, they had remained in the building. So there's this sense that maybe they still remain there and that they do so because they still feel like they own it. One of the apparitions that has been seen on many occasions is known as the woman in white. Many believe her to be Seabree and Eliza Treadwell's eldest daughter, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Treadwell is known to still roam the halls of the Merchant House where she grew up and lived, and I believe that this is because she and her family have lived there their entire lives and she's protective over it. Museum board member Anthony Belov recalls the day he saw the woman in white while preparing for an event at the merchant's house. 
The guest speaker and I were seated here on the main landing discussing what we were going to do. You know, I'll say this, you'll say that, I'll introduce you, that sort of thing. I was seated right on the step, just like this, and she was seated here. And while we were talking, I noticed there was motion and a bit of a rustle up at the top of the staircase. And I was able to look past her, right up to where the staircase bends around again, and there was a woman standing there leaning on the staircase on the handrail and looking down. In fact, I felt our eyes had actually connected. She was wearing a period dress. She looked absolutely solid. I could see her face very clearly. It was a beautiful face, almost heart-shaped. It must have been close to a minute. And then somebody from downstairs hollered up, Anthony, we're ready to open the house. And I looked down, looked up, nobody was there. The mysterious woman had completely vanished, but Anthony was eager to find out more. A couple of days later, I was talking to Pi Gardner, the director of the museum, and I said, oh, I saw something the other night. And she looked at me and she said, who did you see? And it was like one of these duh moments because it never even occurred to me to look at the family photographs and identify who the person was. So we promptly marched over to the display and there she was, as real as real could be, the woman I saw standing at the top of the staircase, and it was Elizabeth Seabury Treadwell Nichols. The ghost of Elizabeth Treadwell is likely to be a projection of the past. The Stone Tape theory is basically a loop where energy is actually absorbed by the fabric of buildings, of the atmosphere surrounding where trauma, murders, accidents, anything takes place that that energy is absorbed by the atmosphere. And the stone tape theory basically is a residual energy and it actually loops and plays itself over and over. If she was having a wander about in her normal everyday life, then chances are you would probably see her still doing that after death. Paranormal investigator Dan Sturges has been collecting recordings in the merchant's house for the past 12 years. During one of these sessions, he captured something remarkable in the bedroom of Treadwell matriarch Eliza. You'll hear my friend Holly, who was uh, somebody that had never been on an investigation before. We were in Eliza's room. And Anthony, you'll hear Anthony in the background ask Mrs. Treadwell if she thinks Holly is pretty. You'll hear Mrs. Treadwell give an answer. Mrs. Treadwell, is it all right if I use your mirror? Do you think Holly's a pretty girl? Pleasant enough. When she's actually asked, is she a nice girl, you actually hear pleasant enough. Now, that is intelligent straight away because she's answered a question. Great capture. And it's an answer to a question. That's an, a direct answer to a... Uh to a question. Significant, you know. Uh, sent that out to my friends who ran it through a battery of tests and said that voice wasn't anybody else in the room, didn't match anybody's voice print in the room, and it came from inside the room, it didn't come from outside, according to them. I think of the EVP recordings that I've heard, this is certainly one of the clearest, if not the clearest, I've come across. Pleasant enough. I mean, it's quite interesting that the phrase pleasant enough was used that feels like something that would be a kind of response of the age when they would have been alive. Most electronic voice phenomena cannot be heard by the human ear and are only discovered when painstakingly re-listening to reels of tape. We record absolutely everything on our investigations and we trawl through hours and hours of recordings. Now, the reason why we do this is because spirits communicate on a level between around about 0.19 of a decibel up to around about 0.21 of a decibel. Our hearing is around about 22 decibels. So in order for us to hear that, we need to train our hearing. But the voice recorders tend to pick up on these frequencies and you're able to hear them speak as clear as day. It blows my mind. It's the scariest part of an investigation because it's usually about a week later I'm listening to the audio. And, uh, and it can get 
extremely tedious because we might have six recorders running for six hours. That's 36 hours of audio I've got to listen to and it's all the same conversation. That's the scariest part for me because I'm, I'm usually in my apartment by myself with the lights off and laying in my bed listening with my headphones. And when you do get a voice, you snap right out of the little meditation you're in while you're doing this and you know rewind and then you go into investigator mode and start putting it through the filters and sending it out to all your colleagues all over the world to get their impression of it. Spirit's very subtle, but they use it to communicate. And if there's a lot of EVPs going on that are being caught in the house, it's because spirit would like to communicate. There's something that the spirits would like to say. It seems as though every nook and cranny of this 19th century home harbors some sort of paranormal activity. And one of the grandest rooms at the Merchant's House Museum is no exception. We're in the front parlor of the Treadwell House right now, and this would have been the best room. This room was reserved for company, for special occasions, for weddings, funerals. This is not a room that would have seen a lot of everyday use, with the exception of the family piano. And it's an interesting piece because over the years we've received many reports of people walking by outside or being in the museum itself and having heard the piano being played. Until recently, the piano was unplayable simply because of its age. Occasionally, Anthony will host concerts in the Merchant's House Museum to raise funds for the upkeep of the building. During one of these classical recitals, the supernatural force in the Treadwell home was simmering. And during rehearsal, we had a lot of strange things going on in the house. There were footsteps upstairs, a door opened and shut itself, and we were aware that there was a certain amount of energy in the house while we were practicing the music. And by the time the concert began, the paranormal energy had intensified even more. I was one of the singers, we were a quartet, and while the leader of the group was speaking, we were sitting in chairs in the front parlor. And I remember sitting there feeling as though I were going to faint and going, who turned on the heat? Because I felt this blast of heat next to me. I was seated here in a chair, suddenly felt someone poke me in the ribs twice, very hard and I thought I had missed a cue or something had gone wrong. I didn't react because I was seated in front of all these people, but it was a very sharp poke. And then afterwards, visitors who had come to the museum heard us comparing notes, and they came up and told us that specifically while that was happening, they saw an elderly lady come in. Four or five people claimed to have seen her and they thought it was odd that none of the performers in front of the audience reacted to her. But she walked right past everyone and sat down in an upholstered armchair that's in the far corner of the room and listened intently to the rest of the concert. I hope she enjoyed it. The paranormal energy at the Merchant's House Museum appears to manifest as two different types of spirit. The kind of sightings and sounds that have claimed to be seen and heard at the Merchant House would correlate with both a residual and an intelligent spirit. A residual spirit is one that would be considered to sort of be playing out continuously on a loop that wouldn't be aware of its surroundings or necessarily aware that it's in our present time. Though an intelligent spirit would be a spirit that's considered to be interacting with the living and one that is kind of responsive to the space in the way that we understand it. One of the intelligent spirits captured by paranormal investigator Dan Sturges is the head of the ghostly family, Seabury Treadwell. We haven't got a lot of communication from Mr. Treadwell. And we were in Seabury's room, Mr. Treadwell's room asking if he knew how to play the piano because they have a piano downstairs in the, uh, in the parlors. We get a male voice saying, uh, I strike the keys in succession. Did you know how to play the piano? 
Mr. Treadwell? Pretty amazing stuff. I've been doing this a long time and you rarely get sentences or as clear a response as we get here at the Merchant's House. Did you know how to play the piano, Mr. Treadwell? In recent years, the museum has come under threat from property developers in this desirable Manhattan area. So how do we ensure that the merchant's house and the spirits within continue to live on in the years to come? The Merchant's House Museum in Manhattan is a perfect example of an upper-class New York townhouse. Once owned by the Treadwell family, it remains relatively untouched, despite being uninhabited for over 80 years. This is the only house in New York City that is, uh, from the 19th century, intact inside and out. And unlike most other museums, this house is all original on the inside. To have the family's original belongings is really very unusual. The importance of this house really can't be overstated. But it's the paranormal activity inside the four walls that fascinates ghost hunter Dan Sturges. He has been exclusively studying the Treadwell home for over a decade. There is a photograph in Eliza's room that was taken by a doctor from Toronto that was sent to the house and then sent to me. The original digital file was sent down to us. And uh, there is a face in the mirror. Now, through my outside work, I work with some government agencies, and there are some guys in these agencies that are into doing this, and, and I can send them digital pictures. So I sent this picture to my friends, and they put it through all their processes, and they said it's not a reflection. It's not light coming off the glass. They thought it was something behind the glass. I can't explain that one. And that's the one I keep on my phone when people think I'm silly for doing this. I pull that out and go, take a look at this, and, and, uh, and it blows people's minds. The photograph taken in Mrs. Treadwell's bedroom at the Merchant House shows a mirror reflecting an image back. Now, the paranormal investigator that took this photograph has captured something uh, that, that looks like an anomaly. It looks like a person stood there reflecting back, but it's difficult to see any features. It's difficult to ascertain who that spirit could be. Is this a real person? Is it not? We have to kind of be a little bit skeptical when we look at photographs or, or look at video clips, but this particular photograph is clear enough to say that there is something there reflecting back. Dan remembers his first ever investigation of the merchant's house. One of the stipulations about me coming in to do an investigation was we had to have a 19th century seance. Now, I was not, at the time, I was not into psychics and, and mediums. That was not my bag. And, and, you know, living in New York City, there were more psychos than psychics out there. And, and, and I hadn't met anybody that I trusted. So they really put me under the gun to put together a 19th century seance. And what I didn't know is that a 19th century seance is pretty much the same as a 21st century seance. I went and I found a, uh, a medium just by luck. I found a fellow named Richard Scholler, uh, who has now become a world-renowned medium. And, and uh, just all the stars aligned, and Richard was getting names, first and last names, dates of when people had worked here. There was a name that kept coming up and still comes up when we bring a medium into the house is Annie McNulty, and she gave us the dates. It was a servant that worked here. We know that the entire time the Treadwells lived here, they had four female servants, usually Irish immigrants, um, who lived and worked here at the house. Um, the servants' quarters at the very top of this house are perhaps the oldest intact site of Irish habitation in New York City, because we know that there have been servants here um, from the 1830s. The information acquired from Annie's spirit could only have been known by someone who had lived in the Treadwell house. She talked about S-shaped settees that were in the house that nobody had known about except for the museum director. She worked in the house for a few years. She lived up in the servants' quarters on the top floor. And a lot of the mediums will bring up her singing. So I think she might have been one of the nannies, possibly, to the kids and would sing them to sleep. As well as Annie, the voice of a child has been captured up on the top floor of the merchant's house. A colleague of mine, we were doing an investigation, and he was introducing the group to whoever might be in the room and said, there's no reason for anybody to be afraid. We're just here to communicate with you. And my friend Sarah, who had never been on an investigation, I asked Sarah, 
Sorry, just to ask a question, don't feel funny, ask a question. And underneath that, you can hear a little girl say, I am not afraid. That's a question, sir. I am not afraid. The EVP captured at the Merchant House is an excellent example of a grade A EVP. The investigator is clearly stating there's nothing to be afraid of when there is a clear response from a little girl saying, I'm not afraid. That's a question, sir. Now, it's quite long doubt, but it's very clear, and phonetically, you can make out exactly what this is saying. But it's an example of a spirit that's intelligently interacting with the investigator. And it sounds like a child. It may well be a spirit of the Treadwell family. That's a question, sir. The Merchant's House Museum continues to thrill visitors with its history and the mystique surrounding the Treadwell family. It very much was turned into a museum because of the way that it was kept and the way that it, the look and the feel of it. So it's time capsuled so they can be at rest and be in the home that they love and not have to worry about anybody moving their things or touching their things or changing things that they don't want them to change. So they can very much stay and just protect it and, and still feel that, that sentimental you know, this has been my home my entire life. Why would I leave when this is my safe place? This is my happy place. But the future of the museum and the legacy of the Treadwell family is in doubt. Well, right now the museum is facing a really serious threat. Um, there is, a developer has applied to put up an eight-story hotel in the lot immediately next door to the museum. We've hired structural engineers and architects to come in and do studies, and there's really no way that the museum could sustain a development of that size in such close quarters. To say that the museum could suffer really catastrophic structural damage is not an overstatement. So we are, of course, very, very, very concerned um, about what the future might hold. People use the word priceless a great deal. This is priceless. This is truly priceless because it cannot be replicated. It cannot be replaced. If one piece of furniture goes, sure, you can buy another piece of furniture. You can have someone make it. You can have a reproduction. You can even have something from the period, but it will not have belonged to the Treadwells. The board of directors have set up a petition and hope to fend off the developers. Glibly speaking, it would be a shame not just to lose the building, but then our resident spirits would be displaced. Where would they go if the merchant's house, if the Treadwell house, you know, was destroyed? I've been a volunteer here at the museum for such a long time simply because I am smitten by this place, absolutely smitten by it. This house is so special. It's so truly unique. It's so important. It's so significant to the history of New York, not because of anything that happened here, but because of what it tells us about a New York that is so long gone and yet was so influential in making New York City what it is today. For now, the spirits are safe inside the museum, and the stories of the Treadwell family and the ghosts they have become will continue to excite both visitors and staff of the Merchant's House. So many things have happened to me in this house over the years that I'm sort of not reacting anymore. I more often than not say hello, good evening, that sort of thing. Oh, you know, thank you for sharing your presence with me. and. I rarely am caught off guard these days. I rarely jump. Still happens occasionally when I really don't expect something, but I get more, I, I guess I could say I get more excited or more happy that the family is interacting with me than anything else. <laughs>